Uh, Father God, we thank you for your word. Would you open our ears, our minds, and our hearts uh, to hear and be transformed by your word. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, in life, we all do face hard decisions, much harder than choosing raspberry or mango ice cream. As difficult as that may be, we do face uh, difficult decisions. And it's actually gotten worse, I feel, <laughs> actually in society. Um, I was born at an age where as a teenager, we used to go to the local blockbuster to rent a video, you know, video VHS. And I don't know if you guys remember this, you would go there, not sure what you'd want to rent, and half an hour would easily go by, especially if you go with your two sisters, what movie are we going to watch? And there's so many choices all along the walls that you end up sometimes getting so frustrated and wondering, oh, there's all these options, we don't know what to choose. Fast forward today, well, that happens with Netflix, right? You're scrolling through, you're like, I want to watch something, but not this or this. And we have so many uh, options or opinions. And we're the age of consumerism. So if you want to buy anything now, guess what? You can read countless reviews. You can scroll and compare different websites. And one reviewer will say, well, option A is better in this way. And another reviewer will say option B is in a different way. And you can sort of be stuck there. Um, but at some point, you make a decision. Where has this come true for me lately? Well, as a young father, strollers, the world of strollers. My mom laughed at, at me because back then she just had one stroller and that's all she may do with. Nowadays, things have changed. So you can read about all sorts of different types of strollers or different brands and compatibility. And guess what? When you're hard pressed between a decision, what's interesting is your decision will reveal the sort of values you have. So let's pretend we're all choosing a stroller together today. There might be some of you in the room who think, oh, I'm a value person. I love being able to say I got a good deal on something, and maybe that's what I really think is most important. So I'm going to choose a stroller based on value. Some people in this room might be like, hey, I'm pushing this thing around all day. I want a stroller. It looks pretty nice. And nowadays, strollers look pretty nice. So you might think, oh, maybe style is something I really value, the aesthetic beauty of the item I choose. Uh, some of you might be like, oh, if you're like me, I carry way too many things. So I need a thing that can carry everything. I want my mug my groceries, my diaper bag, and all these things, and you might really value storage. And some of you might be, well, I gotta bring this thing in and out of the trunk, my car isn't very big, then size and weight become a, a major factor. And so I think often if you're pushed to make a decision, the values that you prioritize highly influence the decision you end up making. So for some of us in the room, one of these four things would probably win out above the others. You can't have them all, and so in a decision, you're forced to choose. Our passage today in Philippians, Paul is also hard-pressed between options. It's not about strollers, but thinking about something quite serious. And his decision reveals his worldview and his values that we're going to spend some time looking at. And so I've entitled this sermon today, Paul's Guiding Life Values. And we will be looking at our passage in Philippians, so I'll help you to have it open. I'll highlight some of the verses as well um, on the screen. Well, if we think about, and we recently did a book of Paul's before Colossians, so you'll recognize some of these slides. Some of you have been coming to our church for a while. There are 66 books in the Bible, and a number of them, all these ones in blue here, were written by the Apostle Paul. And if you look at these books that he written, there's a smaller subset of them as well. Okay, my slides are not functioning. Okay, sorry. These four are known as the prison epistles or prison letters because those letters were actually written at a time when Paul uh, was in trouble with the authorities for being faithful to Jesus, for preaching the gospel. He was in prison. And some of these letters he wrote from there, including the one we read today. Philippians. And so the name of the book, Philippians, comes from the city of Philippi in Greece. So Paul would write letters to all the Christians to encourage them and to teach them more about the faith. And in our letter, Philippians, he's very interested to encourage the Christians who are facing different types of suffering and persecution, okay? So imagine Paul's in prison, and he's thinking about a group of Christians, and this group of Christians is also facing difficulties, just like he is. He's in prison, and he's writing to people facing suffering and persecution. 
Let's take a look at some of Paul's words and see what was his worldview. What sort of values did he have that influenced the way he made decisions and thought about the world? So our passage begins, and this can be found on page 1168. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as is my eager expectation and hope. They will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Let's start with that little bit of beginning. Paul's in prison, writing to people suffering. And in our passage, what is our opening line? Yes, I will rejoice. Paul, in the midst of being in prison and writing to people suffering, has a certain joy about himself. And look at some of these words he uses. Um, there is an eager expectation and hope. And so as Paul thinks about his life, uh, these are some very positive things that you might find quite counterintuitive. If you're in jail, writing to other people you know who are going through difficult times, would you immediately perhaps think of rejoicing together? Would you think of expectation and hope? I think actually quite the opposite, actually. And uh, what is so I think the first thing I was struck by spending time with this passage is Paul has a very interesting worldview then. That seems counterintuitive. It's not what I would immediately jump to if I was in prison and hearing about people I care about going through suffering. And so I thought about that today. You know, this morning as we gather, guess what? There are Christians who gathered in Ukraine for worship this morning too. What is their mood? What is their worldview? You've heard about climate disasters uh, near Libya, near Morocco. Well, Christians gathered there to worship. Some hours ago, there are several time zones ahead of us. What is their worldview? How do they understand their lives? And for us together worshiping here in Vancouver, Canada, what is our worldview? How do we understand our lives? How do we see the world around us? Well, we're going to see more as Paul starts to weigh a couple differences. So the first thing I did want to point out was Paul's worldview. And I, I read you those opening verses of rejoice, eager expectation, and hope. <clears throat> and he says he will do this. He will have this worldview. How? Through the prayers of his brothers and sisters and through the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. <coughs> well, Paul is going to face a couple decisions that he's going to look at. And as we move on to this kind of second half of this first slide, uh, these are the verses we see, and I'll, I'll repeat them here. Paul's weighing of two possibilities. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Paul's considering some of the paths his life could have. And more than ice cream flavors, Paul is actually thinking about life and death as two different possibilities in his life path before him. Talk about a pretty serious crossroads to be at. And in his situation, what he's going to write to the people of Philippi and what we get to hear now, Paul kind of does this. He gives us a little pros and cons list. He thinks about, huh, well, there's me continuing on living, and there's a possibility of me dying. Well, what does he say? He says, well, if I continue living, and he says, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Okay? Fruitful labor. Uh, I think this is a bit of a, a euphemistic term. Where, where is this term? Fruitful labor, okay? You should know, Paul's journey of living for the gospel in Jesus Christ has not been easy. He's in jail. He's been beaten. He's been persecuted. He's run from city to city at different times and times of danger. So when Paul says fruitful labor and puts that on his list of pros and cons, uh, it's a bit of a euphemism. It's, it's difficult. His labor has not been easy. But he does add the word fruitful, that somehow the sufferings that Paul has gone through, he still does connect with somehow God has led that to be a very fruitful thing. Okay? So he puts that, I think, kind of on the cons list, actually. <laughs> to remain in the flesh, to stay in his world and be alive will mean fruitful labor, and for him, maybe that will be more beatings, more time in jail, who knows what. 
And the other thing he says, well, there's something that's far better, actually, he puts on his pros list, which is to depart this life and to be with Christ. And as you read this, you might be, what's going on here? Is Paul contemplating suicide? Is he contemplating his death or something like that? I think as I read this, I would rule out the interpretation of suicide. I think uh, Paul has a strong sense his life belongs to God. I think there's a couple of ways we could read this. Paul is in prison, and at that time, and in the years to come, the Romans would execute many, many Christians. So I think there's a sense that Paul knows, oh, there's a very real possibility I'm in prison here that my life can be in danger. I've already been beaten. I've already been persecuted. Uh, the Lord and Savior I follow, Jesus Christ, was crucified. I may very well depart. So I think that's one way to imagine it, is that uh, to read this passage is that Paul's imagining a very real possibility in his life. I think the other uh, way we can interpret this passage is Paul's thinking about quitting. What would happen if I quit? What if my mission ends here and there's nothing left for me to do on this earth? Is it worth hoping and desiring to go on? So I think those are the two ways I suggest to read it. Now, suicide is a very serious topic, and I think today I do want to, to mention the very important awareness about our mental health, and uh, there are um, those amongst us who will struggle with suicidal thoughts at different times, and I hope if you go through that, that you will reach out to a friend, talk to me, or reach out to the many supports our city and society has now. But I don't think that's precisely what's happening in our passage here. Why does Paul list this as a pro versus con, whether I continue living or if my life were to end? Um, for early Christians, very early on, they understood that our life here on earth is not the only life, actually. There is an afterlife which Jesus moves on to beyond our earthly life. And Paul understands that at some point, our struggle with sin and brokenness, fatigue and death does end. And Paul says there is something far better that does await us. And for us as Christians, that is our hope. That whatever struggles we go through in our life, there is an afterlife where Jesus describes a new heavens, a new earth. There's no tears, there's no pain, and no death. And as Paul thinks about that, he knows in one sense that it's far better. But he's weighing these things. And he literally tells us he's struggling. He says, Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. And so as Paul thinks of this crossroads, these different ways his life could go, to continue on or to depart to be with Christ, um, he struggles. And so I think as he struggles through these decisions, we can actually start to understand Paul's worldview and what are some of the values in his life uh, through which he makes his decisions. So Paul weighs two possibilities. And then he goes on to describe how, he, as he wrestles between this, this is the second slide of the scripture, how is he going to navigate decision? But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. As Paul makes this decision, he realized, no, there's something better. Rather than departing to be with Christ, which is this amazing thing in a lot of ways, Paul somehow says when he does his math between his pros and cons, he still thinks this is a better decision to continue on. And I think in that we see that Paul's overarching life values. I want to point out a few things that we can hear from Paul's tone. I think one of his values is that he understands his life is not his own. It actually belongs to God. And earlier when Paul writes, you know, whether in life or by death, he wishes that Christ will be honored in my body. This is in verse 20. Whether by life or by death. And that sort of attitude of, oh, well, whether I live and die, my desire is that Christ will be honored, shows that Paul understands his life has been bought by Christ. It's not even his own to just simply make decisions with. Which is why, uh, for me, I rule out the interpretation of him being suicidal here. I think there's a very clear sense that he understands my life does not even belong to myself. It is God's. And that's one of his life values that as we go on, we're going to realize really changes the way you approach everything in your life if you actually stop thinking your life is your own, but actually belongs to Jesus 
was paid for and bought at the cross. And when Paul says Christ to be honored, then actually Paul's not thinking about his own honor. If Paul thought, oh man, every time I've been beaten, that was humiliating. Every time people ridiculed me, that was humiliating. Every time I had to run for my life, that was humiliating. He might think, I'm done. Maybe the honorable thing for me to do is just to, for my life to end here. But if his purpose is not for his own honor, but for the honor of Jesus Christ and a different purpose, then Paul also has a different way of imagining the different options in his life. And the way he almost speaks about it is he says, it's actually more necessary. He thinks there's a higher cause for his life. Out of all the different options before him, he believes there's a higher cause in the gospel that he may bless, encourage, and help share the gospel with the people in Greece and the city of Philippi, that he still has a part in his mission and God's plan. You know, next month we're going to be doing a sermon series to talk about evangelism. What does it mean to actually share the gospel with each other? And I think everything going on in our passage hints at what sort of worldview does Paul have that he really desires this? That there's something, there are higher values than ones that we might always live by. My own honor, my own choices, what's best for me, me, me. Paul has some overarching life values that transcend, I think, what our normal human nature would think. And as Paul shows us his worldview, he actually then turns back to his readers and gives all of them a challenge as well. Let's look at what he says here. And this is the last verse for our passage. Only let your manner, so he's been talking about himself, I'm hard-pressed, I'm weighing this, I'm weighing that. Now he turns to us. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul says, actually, this way of I'm living, the way I'm making decisions, my prayer is that you guys will think and make decisions the same way that you will have overarching life values that are greater than our own honor, our own choices. But the, cost, the gospel of Jesus Christ is life-changing in Paul. And this is why I think sometimes Christians, we put things backwards. We think, oh, oh, I guess I'm always supposed to make the good and right decision. And that's kind of true, I guess. You know, I simplified it for the children that we do want to think about what God thinks but actually, when our, we allow our values and our worldview to be shaped by God, we will make the decisions of God as well. If our heart is shaped by the gospel, what will flow out of that is decisions that are not based on what the world would value, but based on what God would value and the gospel. And I pray that for us, as we think about evangelism, and it's really hard particularly in Canadian culture, to think about how do we share the gospel with others? Um, I hope that we will imagine, will we allow our hearts, just like Paul, to be shaped and transformed by the gospel? And we start to see a hint of that in this one uh, mysterious verse in the middle here. A hint at Paul's heart. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For Paul, whether option... Either option, continuing on, he understands his life is found in Jesus anyways. And actually, if he were to die, which for us we might consider the worst possible loss that our world can face, someone passes away, we think it's ultimate tragedy. Paul says, no, there's even a gain there. So whether I live or whether I die, um, God's purposes can be fulfilled. There's something good in both and it is almost a sort of a, a holy apathy that Paul has about his life. And if we could imagine him thinking about what that with life and death, then how much more would our lives be transformed if we face big decisions? Oh, maybe I'll get this job or maybe I won't. And that might cause me a lot of stress, but oh, maybe as Paul reminds us, whether I get the job or whether I not, may Christ be honored. And we face so many different decisions uh, this gives us a hint at what Paul's heart is. And when I thought about Paul, how do you think like this? How does he 
imagine, whether in life or death, that's really, really hard. I think Paul gives us a hint in a further chapter that he doesn't do this on his own. His example is Jesus himself. And so Philippians 2, it reads this, and I've shortened it down. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any participation in the Spirit, do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's telling us, think like Jesus. Let's imagine the, Jesus' values and worldviews. And what did Jesus do? He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. He humbled himself, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. I said, as I said at the very beginning of our service today, at Holy Communion, we remember that Jesus faced a choice. He was actually hard-pressed, just like Paul was. You know, one artist draws Jesus' night in Gethsemane like this. And Jesus faced a difficult choice. There was a mission that God the Father had given him, a terrible mission, a difficult, painful mission path of suffering and sacrifice and Jesus wrestled is this the option and so difficult was his mission that he needed to be alone and just pray that evening he was hard pressed between two options and ultimately what Jesus chose at his crossroads is he chose father let your will be done and so Paul didn't get this from himself when Paul thought, thought about whether I live or die God would you be honored Jesus actually modeled that to him. As Jesus went to the cross, he thought, well, even if I die and suffer, there's something greater here. Well, we've come a long way from stroller options. You know, as I, even as I wrote this, I felt uh, convicted afterwards. You know why? Because when I thought about all the values we use to choose, they're all about me. So actually, they're all about me. This actually has nothing to do with forest, <laughs> baby forest. These are all about me thinking about what's best for me. And when I think about what Paul challenged us to worldview, I think the greatest opponent to us having that worldview that exists in our culture today is we are a culture of self-worship. We are obsessed with the self. And so whenever we make a decision, it's so easy to think what's best for me. And when I read reviews or weigh my different options, so often at the end of the day, I'm thinking, what will please myself the most? I think Paul's worldview, and I think what Jesus chose to do in his sacrifice, isn't just something we can think, oh, if I think hard enough, I can do this. When Paul challenges us to live a life worthy of the gospel, I think we need to remember one of the greatest values of the gospel is love. When Jesus is hard pressed in a garden, I think his overarching value is love. I will go to the cross for my lost sheep. I will do that. And when Paul sits in prison, I don't think he just thinks, oh, I think the good thing, a good thing a Christian would do is continue on, and build up other people. He chooses because he loves. He so understands the love of God given to him that he will continue on so he has the opportunity to love others as well. Yes, Forrest agrees. <laughs> what is the overarching values in the kingdom of God? What is the overarching value of the gospel? What is the overarching value in Holy Communion? Is the love of Christ as expressed to you and I. So when Paul challenges us to have the same mind of Christ, I hope we do not fall into what I often fall into, uh, just self-worship. But that we would be moved by the love of God. And that love would transcend all the different values that we may have. That we would live for Christ to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We may love our neighbor as ourselves and ask God, what are your purposes? How might I love the world that you came and died for? Amen.